Hi everyone, I'm Tom Pettit. What would it have been like to be at the Kirtland Temple on the day it was dedicated by the Prophet Joseph Smith on March 27, 1836? I'm going to share with you those details. Who spoke? What did they speak about? And perhaps most importantly, what was it like for the people in attendance? The people that were there that later shared their testimonies of the things they saw, they felt, and they heard. Even those wonderful divine manifestations of the Lord accepting this as being his house. Pictured here behind me is the pulpits on the first floor of the Kirtland Temple. It was from these pulpits where the prophet would stand and deliver the dedicatory prayer. Here in those pulpits, along with others, sat the church leaders while over a thousand people gathered in attendance as part of the congregation to witness these wonderful, miraculous, and very sacred events that would take place on that day when the Kirtland Temple was dedicated. Eliza R. Snow was there, and of the dedication, she said, the ceremonies of that dedication may be rehearsed, but no mortal language can describe the heavenly manifestations of that memorable day. Angels appeared to some, while a sense of divine presence was realized by all present, and each heart was filled with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Now, Preparation to build and finally dedicate this temple didn't all happen at once. In fact, it happened many years earlier in New York is where the story really starts. At that time, on January 2nd, 1831, Joseph and Emma were living with the Whitmer family on their farm in Fayette, New York. And on that day, Joseph Smith received a revelation. It's now recorded as section 38 of the Doctrine and Covenants, wherein verse 32 says, Wherefore, the Lord speaking to Joseph, for this cause I gave unto you the commandment, that you should go to the Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high. More than five years prior to the dedication of the temple, the Lord would command Joseph, you've got to leave New York, you've got to head over to Ohio, a place you've never been, and there we will establish a house, a temple where I will give unto you my law and endow you with power from on high. Joseph Smith was quick in his obedience. He and Emma pulled up in Kirtland on February 4th, 1831, just a few days long beyond a month since that commandment was originally given to Joseph to move to Ohio. And he did it, and he did it quickly. Two and a half years later, the Lord would bring up the topic of the temple again with Joseph. Joseph, for those two and a half years, he was busy establishing the church in that area, and he was organizing the uh, quorums and, and uh, classes and holding meetings and everything else that would be the structural organization of the church. He was busy putting that in place. So two and a half years after his arrival, we now come to June 1st of 1833, and the Lord gives this commandment again to Joseph. It's recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 95, verse 8. Yea, verily I say unto you, I gave unto you a commandment that you should build a house, in the which house I designed to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. It was a reminder, somewhat of a stern reminder to Joseph, hey, you're busy, but you're not busy doing the most important thing. The reason you came to Ohio, and that's to build the temple. Now is the time. So Joseph and others, they got to work on the construction of, of the temple. Now, the, the miraculous funding and overall construction of the Kirtland Temple is a wonderful story all in itself, and I'm certain I'll do a video on it. But for this video, I want to focus exclusively on the dedicatory services of the Kirtland Temple. But needless to say, I will give you a quote from Eliza R. Snow about that construction period of the temple that was going on in Kirtland, because it's, I think it's important to understand from her perspective what was going on to really love and appreciate what happened on the day of dedication. So in preparation for telling you the whole story of that day of dedication, I want to share with you this quote from Eliza R. Snow about the construction. At that time, the saints were few in number, and most of them very poor. And had it not been for the assurance that God had spoken and commanded that a house should be built to his name, of which he had not only revealed the form, but also the designated the dimensions, an attempt towards build, building that temple under the then existing circumstances would have been, 
by all concerned, pronounced preposterous. But it was with faith that they did it anyway. And they were able to complete the construction of the temple. So that on March 27, 1836, Joseph, the other leaders of the church, and over a thousand people could gather together in this very room and they could enjoy that, that sacred and special experience when the temple was being dedicated. The doors were to open, or rather the dedicatory service was to start at 9 a.m. The doors would be open to the public at 8 a.m. Joseph found that people started lining up at the front door of the temple at 7 a.m. in hopes to get a, a seat. They came into this room that's pictured behind me. They sat on pews all looking toward towards the front where these pulpits are, where Joseph and the other leaders of the church were, were seated. And they crammed over a thousand people into, in, in, into this room. Now, fortunately, the fire marshal wasn't there because he wouldn't have allowed it to go on because they crammed everybody they could into that space. In fact, days leading up to the uh, dedication, uh, a mother, a young mother, asked Father Smith if she could bring her small child. And he said, she, he told her, if your child is well behaved, then, and can sit on your lap so as not to take a, a seat, then yes, that baby can come. Well, it seems that word got around a little bit that Father Smith granted permission that that baby can sit on its mother's lap. Because when Joseph entered the room, he found that every seat was occupied by at least two people, sometimes even three people deep, as everybody was sitting on each other's laps. So thrilled and excited were they to be there as part of those services. Well, even stacking people on top of each other and cramming everyone into every available space, there were still more people outside that just couldn't get in. And so Joseph instructed some leaders of the church to escort or invite at least those people who couldn't get into the temple to the nearby schoolhouse where they could have a, a religious service, where they could share testimony and sing and prayer. And whatnot and have their own uh, special experience and they did that until the schoolhouse was overflowing with people so then joseph directed that the that the windows of the temple be opened and so people outside could come as close as they could to those open windows and listen as hard as they could peering their head in into the window or close to it and trying to hear at least some of the things that were taking place on the inside of the temple well, with all of this, Joseph announced, okay, to help accommodate everybody, we're going to redo this service in a couple of days, which they did. And uh, by all accounts, it was just as marvelous and spirit-filled as the original dedication. But let me review now the itinerary of the original dedication. March 27, 1836, 9 a.m., here in the Kirtland Temple, the services get underway to dedicate this house to the Lord. <clears throat> Sidney Rigdon, he was conducting. Joseph Smith, the prophet, of course, was presiding. Sidney opened up the meeting by reading Psalms 96 and then Psalms 24 out of the Old Testament. The choir then sang, Ere long the veil will rend in twain, and Sidney Rigdon gave the opening prayer. Now, unfortunately, no one was around taking shorthand or at least there aren't any documents of shorthand transcript of the services that have been discovered yet. Those would come later, you know, as, as other people would give general conference talks and other uh, uh, discourses. Um, those shorthand scribes would take detailed accounts of what was being said. But we don't really know what, uh, <clears throat> what was going on in, the, uh, in this dedication and, and the words that were actually said. But we do have a very detailed itinerary of exactly how this program unfolded. So, of course, I'll share that with you and any insight that we have gathered through historical records as to what the context of some of these talks were. Of course, I'm, I'm going to include that in well, as well. So after Sidney Rigdon gives the opening prayer, the congregation then sings, O happy souls who pray where God appoints to hear. Sidney Rigdon then took the pulpit and he was the first speaker. He spoke for two and a half hours, nonstop. His subject was Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 through 20. Now, we don't know anything more 
about the content of his of his talk. So I'm going to read to you those verses, those three verses, to give you an idea of the background and what those his words would have been based on. From Matthew 8, 18 through 20, it says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The fox have holes, and the birds of their air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And we can gather a few things of what Sidney Rigdon must have spoken about for two and a half hours, just on those three short verses. One, the dedication and the desire for that individual to follow the Savior. Wherever you go, I'm coming with you, said the scribe. And I bet that Sidney Rigdon talked about that as being, we've got evidence of people in our congregation who have a heart and soul like this individual. And yet all of us can still improve and do better in being more committed and dedicated to following the Savior. Perhaps he talked about that. Could he talk about it for two and a half hours? Maybe so. And then the, the final verse where the Savior replies to the scribe, foxes have holes and birds have of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Perhaps Sidney was reminding the congregation that now, now, or soon within the next few minutes, there will be a place dedicated on earth where the Savior can and will come. That must have been wonderful. The Messenger and Advocate was the name of the local newspaper. And in it, it kind of gave the minutes, or not the minutes of the, of the uh, meeting, but rather the itinerary that we're going through now. And in that uh, newspaper, it was recorded this, the editor referring to Sidney Rigdon's two and a half hour talk, uh, quote, he spoke for two hours and a half in his usual forcible and logical manner. Eliza R. Snow recorded her uh, response or her feelings in response to Sidney Rigdon's talk when she said, at one point, as he reviewed the toils and privations of those who had labored in rearing the walls of that sacred edifice, he drew tears from many eyes, saying, There were those who had wet those walls with their tears, when, in the silent shades of the night, they were praying to the God of heaven to protect them, and stay the unhallowed hands of ruthless spoilers, who had uttered a prophecy, when the foundation was laid, that the walls should never be erected. When he concluded that two and a half hour talk, Joseph Smith, the prophet, stood up. He, <clears throat> he gave a, a short uh, uh, talk, and then he was sustained as prophet and seer. After the sustaining of Joseph Smith as prophet and seer, the choir and congregation sang the hymn, Now Let Us Rejoice, after which a 15 minute intermission. But no one moved because as Needful as it was to probably stand up and stretch your legs and, and take that 15 minute break, nobody dared to leave their seat because of the mass of people that were outside anxious to get in. And so although it was announced a 15 minute intermission, everybody stayed still. They sat where they were. 15 minutes later, uh, the congregation was invited to sing, This Earth Was Once a Garden Place. Another name for that same song is Adam on Diamond. Then Joseph Smith stood and he spoke for a few minutes. And then he uh, went through the sustaining of the church leaders. It's reported in the Messenger and Advocate that the state sustaining was unanimous. The congregation was then uh, invited to sing another song called How Pleased and Blessed Was I. And then came the dedication. After that congregational hymn, Joseph Smith stood up and he read the dedicatory prayer. It's recorded now as section 109 in the Doctrine and Covenants. And the prophet testified that that prayer had been revealed to him. It was a revelation. And as we read that dedication, we find that the promises and the, and the blessings that are offered within section 109 come directly from the Lord as they were revealed to the prophet Joseph from him. I'll share with you just three verses from the dedicatory uh, prayer of uh, section 109 verses 12 and 3. This could really answer the question of why was the temple built? Why did they do it? The Lord says in that, in that revelation, that thy glory may rest down upon thy people 
and upon this thy house, which we now dedicate to thee, that it may be sanctified and consecrated to be holy, and that the holy presence, and that thy holy presence may be continually in this house, and that all people who shall enter upon the threshold of the Lord's house may fill thy power, and feel constrained to acknowledge that thou hast sanctified it, and that it is thy house, a place of thy holiness. And then in verse 22, We ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house, armed with thy power, and that thy name may be upon them, and thy glory be round upon, about them, and thine angels have charge over them. At the conclusion of the dedicatory prayer, the choir then sang, The Spirit of God, Like a Fire is Burning, written by W. W. Phelps. Then the sacrament was blessed and passed to the congregation. After the ordinance of the sacrament, testimonies were given by Joseph Smith, his younger brother, Don Carlos Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Frederick G. Williams, and David Whitmer. In Frederick G. Williams' testimony, he shared that during the service, he says, a holy angel of God entered the temple and came and sat down between Joseph Smith Sr. and himself, both of whom were seated on the, in, the, uh, in the seats pictured here behind me. Heber C. Kimball, who was in the congregation, he testified of that same experience that Frederick G. Williams shared. In fact, he reported, Elder Kimball did, in describing that individual who President Williams saw, I call him President Williams because he was a counselor in the first presidency, Elder Kimball says he was tall, this angel, had black eyes and white hair and stooped shoulders, and his garment was whole, extending to near his ankles. On his feet, he had sandals. He was sent to accept the dedication. Now, Joseph Smith, in, re in, in part of his recollection of the dedicatory services, among many other things that I'll share with you, he said that Peter, the ancient apostle, had come to witness the dedication. And there's not a connection, but maybe there could be, that the angel who Frederick G. Williams and Heber C. Kimball saw could have been that prophet, that uh, the apostle Peter. Uh, but it was never connected. It was just their testimony and experience with seeing that angel and describing in detail what he looked like. And then in a later separate comment, Joseph said that the apostle Peter had, had also been there. After uh, all those testimonies by all those wonderful men, then there were two talks, brief talks, one by Hiram Smith and then again by Sidney Rigdon. Sidney Rigdon had a second uh, talk to give. And then a prayer was offered by Sidney Rigdon. Following the prayer of Sidney Rigdon, the Hosanna shout was given. And this is shouting three times, Hosanna, 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 to God and the Lamb. Each series of Hosannas ended with three amens. Brigham Young, not on the program, spontaneously stood up and started to speak in tongues. Elder David W. Patton quickly stood up and gave the interpretation of what was being spoken. Again, not recorded is, uh, is the interpretation of what Brigham Young had said. Joseph Smith, after Brigham Young and David W. Patton sat down, Joseph stood up. He would have given some closing remarks, of course. He probably would have provided special blessings and promises to those that were in attendance. But regardless of what he may have said, he did conclude the services at four o'clock in the afternoon, concluding the seven hour long dedicatory services. Of the dedication, Joseph Smith recorded in his journal simply this, The Spirit of God rested upon the congregation, and great solemnity prevailed. I'd like to share with you some of the special and sacred spiritual manifestations that took place during the dedication services. <clears throat> uh, a woman by the name of Prescindia Huntington, she wasn't in the temple during the dedication services, but she was in her own home, which was near the temple. And she said this of her experience, while not in the temple, yet what happened while the temple was being dedicated. She said, I went to the door of my home, and there I saw on the top of the temple angels, clothed in white, 
covering the roof from end to end. They seemed to be walking to and fro. They appeared and disappeared. The third time they appeared and disappeared, I realized that they were not mortal men. Each time, in a moment, they vanished, and their reappearance was the same. This was in broad daylight, in the afternoon. A number of children saw the same. Prescindia Huntington has one of the rare recordings of, uh, of this experience. But of some of those other recordings of this experience, one woman thought that the temple was on fire. It was glowing in broad daylight. And it was, it was looking as though it were in, in, in being uh, encircled by flames of fire, as it were. In fact, she called the fire department or called out the fire alarm. And uh, people came running until they realized that they weren't seeing fire, but rather a divine manifestation of something very special that was taking place on the inside. Joseph Smith, I'd like to read one more quote of his. Uh, that night, so after the dedica dedication was dismissed at four o'clock, Joseph Smith uh, invited about 319 individuals to return that night for another special service, which they'd share testimony, they'd pray, and they'd sing. Of that meeting, Joseph Smith said, all the congregate during a, during a moment of this meeting, all the congregation simultaneously arose, being moved upon by an invisible power. Many began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Others saw glorious visions, and I beheld the temple was filled with angels, which fact I declared to the congregation. The people of the neighborhood came running together, hearing an unusual sound within and seeing a bright light like a pillar of fire resting upon the temple, and were astonished at what was taking place. Oliver Cowdery, who was in that meeting that evening, he said, the spirit was poured out. I saw the glory of God, like a great cloud came down and rested upon the house and filled the same like a mighty rushing wind. I also saw cloven tongues, like, like as of fire rest upon many, for there were 316 present, while they spake with other tongues and prophesied. One week later, <clears throat> so the temple was dedicated on March 27th. One week later would be April 3rd. And that year, or, yeah, in that year, 1836, that day, April 3rd, happened to be Easter. It was Easter, and Joseph had gathered some individuals to come to a meeting on Easter. And Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith, they came up here to the pulpits. From the roof, of the of this room uh, hung drapes that could be raised and lowered so that they could divide the room into smaller classrooms so that you could have multiple meetings going on within this one larger assembly room so the congregation was there in the seats joseph and oliver come up here to the pulpits they drop one of those curtains for privacy so now they're they're separate from everybody else in the room and they begin to pray and as they're on their knees praying the Savior, the resurrected Lord, on Easter, in his temple, came and stood on these pulpits and spoke to Joseph and Oliver. From this pulpit, the Savior said, or excuse me, Joseph Smith says this, as it's recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 110. The veil was taken from our minds, and the eyes of our understanding were opened. We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold, in color like amber. His eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of a rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah, saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Behold, your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice. Let the hearts of your brethren rejoice, and let the hearts of all my people rejoice, who have with their might built this house to my name. For behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. Yea, I will appear unto my servants, and speak unto them with mine own voice, if my people will keep my commandments, and do not pollute this holy house. Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands 
shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out, and the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. And the fame of this house shall be spread to foreign lands, and this is the beginning of the blessing which shall be poured out upon the heads of my people. Even so, amen. The Savior then left the, these pulpits, and Joseph and Oliver were left alone for just a moment until Moses appeared here at these pulpits. Laying his hands upon the heads of Joseph and Oliver, he bestowed the keys of the gathering of Israel. After Moses had performed that uh, ordination, he left and Elias then followed. And then Elijah, both of them, ancient prophets, bringing and restoring keys of the kingdom of God to the earth, right directly onto the heads of Joseph and Oliver Cowdery. With the keys that were delivered from those three ancient prophets to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, every blessing that church membership offers to all of God's children originated right here from the pulpits in the Kirtland Temple. I'll conclude now with where we started. The original promise that the Lord gave to Joseph Smith in January of 1831 as to why we build temples. He gave this commandment, Wherefore, for this cause I gave unto you the commandment that you should go to the Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law and endow you with power from on high. And so he did. And so he continues to do inside each and every temple that's dedicated to him. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more videos of stories from church history, please visit my video collection at tomcpettit.com by clicking the link in the video description below.